Okay, hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing in our study on the book More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. I guess this is part 10. Uh, if you haven't seen the first nine uh, discussions on this, uh, they're already uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, I hope you will take the time to watch this from the beginning. But uh, we're going to uh, today pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we're near the end of chapter 8 in this book. There's only 11 chapters. The book's only 128 pages, so we are nearing the end. I'm estimating we'll probably have maybe three or four more studies and we'll be finished with this uh, this topic. But I'm really enjoying it. As long as it lasts, I'm happy. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Brother Joe and Brother Ted to say hi. Uh, Brother Joe, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, this is Joe from the Sebastian Dresden Channel. And uh, my channel is uh, about fellowship and uh, and exploring, not so much teaching, uh, but uh, always uh, enjoy having brothers uh, sub to me or people that uh, are not believers sub to me. That's fine, too. Uh, I just like to interact with people. That's why I'm here. So looking forward to uh, continuing the study of this awesome book. Back to you, Luke. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, I will say that... Uh... Brother, Brother Joe is an extremely humble saint. Uh, he's always under underplaying or under valuing, underestimating his uh, his ability to contribute uh, in terms of his knowledge. He is very knowledgeable. In fact, he has some insights that are just fascinating. They're just different, and I always look forward to it. Uh, so uh, please subscribe to his YouTube channel, Sin, um, Sin City Preacher. That's me. <laughs> I mean, Sebastian Dresden. And we uh, we also have with us today uh, Brother Ted. Say hi, please. Hi, it's Brother Ted uh, here from Lubbock, Texas. And uh, my channel is called God's Truth Ministries. And I have uh, a few videos on there, just a smidgen compared to how many Brother Luke has. But uh, same type of uh, themes. Uh, getting the gospel out, evangelizing, and uh, getting the, the basic truth out of the fact that Jesus loves us and died for our sins and rose again to come give us an abundant life, and uh, some other edifying videos for uh, of other topics for uh, Christians, and just uh, encourage the believers in the world we have, and I hope that's what you have today when you uh, follow along with this study in a book that was, like I said last time, and every time... This book was really special to me, this little booklet called More Than a Carpenter. When I first got saved, and it's had a, always had a special place in my heart, so I, I pray you guys stick around and, and uh, get encouraged by it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Brother Ted. Uh, uh, Brother Ted is uh, just scratching the surface in terms of what he has uh, to contribute to, for all of us on YouTube. Uh, he's got some excellent videos, and I can say that confidently about Brother Ted and Brother Joe that uh, uh, you're not going to find anybody that is is uh, a more um, um, correct or more solid in their in their foundation that uh, the salvation is a free gift uh, this some a lot of people refer to this as uh, the free grace theology uh, I made a little short video recently <clears throat> saying uh, free gift theology. <clears throat> I like the term free gift. Uh, it, it just seems to be more understandable to the average person rather than free grace. But they certainly understand that salvation is a free gift. And so you can count on them to, uh, uh, you're going to get the true message of salvation uh, from them. Now let's continue on with this study here. Um, let me see. Last time... We, we discussed some of the arguments that people use when they try to debunk the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And let me see, to, I'm not going to review, uh, review them, I'll just list them all, but some of them are that um, the, uh, oops, where was I? Okay, this is the chapter 8, that uh, 
Jesus' uh, uh, body was stolen uh, by his disciples, that uh, they, when they went to the, the tomb, they were actually went to the wrong tomb, that, uh, uh, that he was in a swoon state, that uh, he didn't actually die, but he was in the tomb and barely alive. And so that's why when he came out that um, you know, he, he could show himself alive. But uh, obviously, uh, that wouldn't be very convincing to very many people that just the fact that he was alive and, and so and so close to death, it should, people would not be confident that this is a victorious uh, Savior who's uh, victorious over death. Uh, these are some of the things that we've talked about. And there's, there's, now we're on uh, evidence for the resurrection. Um, that's the title of this paragraph or this section here, but it says, Professor Thomas Arnold, for 14 years, the headmaster of rugby, author of a famous three-volume history of Rome, and appointed to the chair of modern history at Oxford, was well acquainted with the value of evidence in determining historical facts. He said, quote, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them, and I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is so proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort <clears throat> to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead, unquote. That was really, uh, his statement was interesting, but really what got my attention was he says for 14 years he's the headmaster of rugby. I'm not sure if that's referencing the the sport of rugby or if I'm just not understanding it. But <clears throat> let me <laughs> ask Brother Joe for your thoughts first. Well, I I, I think it, at this point it's it's good to just point back to our our last uh, video that we did. We 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 spent a hour and a half or something uh, extensively going over uh, the evidences of the resurrection and of course that's a pivotal point in our faith and uh, you know we had mentioned uh, such stalwarts like C.S. Lewis and Simon Greenleaf, Greenleaf and, uh, and others who uh, went out to disprove the Bible were challenged they were challenged by, by their betters to uh, mentors or whatever to go out and disprove the Bible and uh, they came back believers and, and uh, the things that we went over on the last uh, last time we were together uh, firmly established that, that they had good reason to be both uh, brilliant and persuaded that the resurrection was a historical fact. Back to you, Luke. All right, thank you. And, uh, Brother Ted, your thoughts? Well, I think the, uh, like uh, Joe said, the theories uh, of the resurrection seem to be examined uh, more with an open mind from, you know, historians in the past. You know, I could be wrong, but it, uh, revisionism seems to be, uh, you know, unfortunately more prevalent nowadays, whereas uh, the historians in the past, whether it regarded, you know, American history, American documents, uh, uh, the position of our founders or whatever, and then you're going back even further, you know, uh, to the time of Christ, uh, historians of the past seem to at least have the credibility on their side that they were going to be, yeah, you know, whatever I am, whether I'm an atheist or whether I'm a Christian or not, uh, they seem to be delving into the evidence more, you know, the historical evidence, uh, the archaeological evidence, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the historical sources, you know, historical uh, evidence, whatever. So uh, I, I'm not saying older is better, but I'm saying uh, let's look at these wise men of the past that looked at this uh, mainly from an open mind and an open heart regarding the resurrection. And uh, I think we can say these learned men, much more brighter than us put together probably, who looked at this with an open mind and looked at the historical facts and the sources that they had, uh, 
it seems like they could have debunked the resurrection or that uh, that the evidence was truly for the resurrection, but they didn't. Uh, a lot of them, like you said, came to uh, the table wanting to refute the resurrection, but they ended up believing in it and believing on Christ. So uh, it's a good starting point. Back to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, if if um, the, uh, the viewing audience is uh, watching this video without watching the first nine in this uh, study, <clears throat> uh, you're you're at a big disadvantage because we've covered so much ground, <clears throat> uh, particularly the last two or three sessions that we, or maybe four sessions that we've been talking about the resurrection and the reasons to believe there actually was a bodily resurrection. And now we're looking at, we've been looking at the reasons to not believe it, the, the, the arguments against the bodily resurrection. And uh, the arguments against it are just inane, uh, easily just laughed at. So we, we've covered both sides of this, and uh, I would ask you to watch those videos, and you be the judge uh, of whether it's more credible that there really was a bodily resurrection of Jesus, or whether these uh, uh, arguments against it have any kind of uh, you know substance to them at all. Um, so I'll continue reading here. It says, <clears throat> English scholar Brooke Foss Westcott said, quote, taking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. Nothing but the antecedent assumption that it must be false could have suggested the idea of deficiency in the proof of it." Unquote. Now here's Simon Greenleaf that uh, I believe uh, Brother Joe has cited him numerous times already. <clears throat> so it says, Dr. Simon Greenleaf was one of the greatest legal minds we have had in this country. He was uh, the famous royal professor of law at Harvard University and succeeded Justice Joseph Story as the Dean Professor of Law in the same university. H.W.H. Knotts in the Dictionary of American Biography says of him, quote, to the efforts of Story and Greenleaf is ascribed the rise of the Harvard Law School to its eminent position among the legal schools of the United States." Unquote. While professor of law at Harvard, Greenleaf wrote a volume in which he examined the legal value of the apostles' testimony to the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> he observed that it was impossible that the apostles, quote, could have persisted in affirming the truths they had narrated had not Jesus actually risen from the dead, and had they not known this fact as certainly as they knew any other fact, unquote. Greenleaf concluded that the resurrection of Christ was one of the best supported events in history according to the laws of legal evidence administered in courts of justice. Brother Joe, your thoughts on that? Yeah, he's a kind of a hero of mine. He went on to uh, uh, establish the, the Greenleaf School of Law uh, within Harvard and then without. But yeah, he's the one that uh, we can thank for the, the jurist look at, at the resurrection as if it were submitted to uh, an evidentiary court, and so that's his claim to fame, I suppose. It's been repeated many times, and uh, it's a very effective tool at establishing the truth of, of the resurrection. And so, <clears throat> you know, it's back in uh, his day, uh, there was a lot more uh, uh, critical evidence through historical writings available to people in, in higher learning. And I said this last week, and I'll repeat it just one, once more today. Uh, Charles Krauthammer, uh, last week on uh, uh, Fox News, was asked, you know, how do you think history books will be written regarding President Obama's uh, tenure as president? And, and he said, well, that depends on who writes the history. 
And and then another phrase that comes to mind is history is often written with an eraser. And and uh, so today's student or today's uh, scholars should they decide to do what what Lewis or Greenleaf did and take a, a, a real critical look at the facts of the resurrection, they're going to be hard pressed to find those facts, to find the evidence that uh, that these gentlemen did without blowing a lot of dust off of uh, some books in the back of the uh, library or digging very deep indeed onto the internet to find uh, what was commonly available uh, 50 and 100 years ago. Uh, a lot of uh, history has been written with an eraser in our generation and, and uh, evolution and, and uh, materialistic thought uh, controls textbooks and, and they deleted, omitted, or changed a lot of the evidentiary information that a critical mind could see to come up with the same conclusion that these brilliant men did. And so it, it's, it's becoming harder and harder for men of uh, good character to look at things from a, a, a vantage point of evidence anymore because the evidence is disappearing. Uh, back to you, Lou. All right. Thank you. And Brother Ted, what are your thoughts on Simon Greenleaf's uh, uh, position? We can't hear you or see you, so I don't know if you can correct that or not. Sorry, sorry about that. I thought I unmuted both. Um, no, getting back to what Joe said, uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, what's known as the uh, as the secularist golden rule. You know, he who has the gold makes the rules. And I think in regards to academia, academia and things like that, it's he who controls makes the rules. Uh, but uh, getting back to, uh, I think your first quote was from Westcott, who said, "Taking all the evidence together, that's a good, that's a good uh, point to think about because the totality of evidence for the resurrection uh, seems to me to be the, the the key point. And then you can get into the details, but the totality of evidence as a whole, you know." confirms the resurrection, and then you get into the finer points of it, the details of it, and they just add weight to the fact of the resurrection, in my opinion. Uh, and then you have these brilliant minds, a brilliant legal mind, like Simon Greenleaf. Uh, you know, that's somebody you don't want to just dismiss. Uh, he was certainly a critical thinker of his day, and people who look at this critically and who say, yeah, I really don't want to believe it if it's not true, but I don't want to dismiss it if it's not true. I believe that's the way we need to take a look at the resurrection, whether you're a lay person or a, or a highly educated person. Look at it critically, weigh all the evidence in its totality, and, and see, see for yourself. So, back to you. Hmm. Well, you know, we have cited, uh, let me adjust this there, camera. We have cited... Um, Numerous people, probably dozens of people, um, quoted them uh, already in this study. Uh, who uh, we listed their credentials uh, that, and showing that these are not people that are, uh, let's say, living in the backwoods and missing teeth with a straw in their mouth and playing the banjo. They, 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 these people are some of the most educated and most respected uh, people uh, that uh, otherwise otherwise would be greatly esteemed but when considering their viewpoints on Christianity, the Bible, the resurrection uh, people would um, are quick to uh, dismiss them but their, their qualifications for, in terms of their intelligence and their education uh, is, is nobody is, has is any better, is more qualified, more educated. I think that this is a, a thing that many people uh, who are um, anti-Christian, not or let's say they're, an atheist is someone who says, simply says, uh, uh, I don't believe that God exists, but an anti-theist or an anti-Christian, 
this is a person that is not only holds a, a viewpoint that is not true, but they're adamantly against it and determined to disprove it and, and uh, as an enemy of theism, the Bible, Christianity. And the, these people, they're, they're very quick to, tr to try to uh, um, demean the, the three of us and all the other, any other people who actually believe the Bible and uh, through apologetics, which is a, a, a um, methodology to show you the evidence that supports it, they want to write us off as just uneducated fools. Uh, but that's not the case at all. That uh, many many people uh, like Simon Greenleaf. We, we've cited uh, the author of this book here, Josh McDowell, and uh, also, another author that's been popular the last 20 years or so, Lee Strobel, and, and there's many others that we could add to this list, that their original intention was to, uh, they were an antagonist. They, they were uh, against um, either theism, the Bible, Christianity, and it was their objective to disprove it. And many people throughout history have taken on that task, but many of them have been converted because the harder they try to disprove it, the more convinced they were that it can't be disproven and therefore they had to be accepted. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, as if, if you're watching this series, that you can adopt the kind of attitude that even, even though you may be a skeptic, there's a saying that I, I've quoted numerous times in, over the years in my videos. Skepticism is the antiseptic of the mind. In other words, it cleanses your mind. It's good to be skeptical. I, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm not going to just accept anything, whether it's science, religion, uh, you know, politics. I'm not just going to be so readily to accept everything. Uh, I, I need to study it out, and, and it has to be proven to me. Skepticism is healthy. Skepticism is the antiseptic of the mind. But the quote goes on to say, remember why we debate. Uh, the, the only thing that we have to lose are the errors that we hold. And then finally, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been uh, exposed? So uh, that's the kind of attitude that I think is healthy. Uh, and I've had that attitude regarding um, all kinds of theological uh, positions um, over the years. And because I've been willing to have the debates and the arguments among friends and listen to their point of view, sometimes I, I was proven wrong. And I certainly didn't want to be a stubborn fool and hold on to a, a, a doctrinal position once it's, I've been shown that I was wrong. And I'm hoping that if you're watching this series here that you can have that attitude that, look, don't be a stubborn fool and hold on to anti-theism, anti-Christianity, uh, simply because of stubbornness. Once you see that, that the evidence is uh, overwhelming, supporting that the Bible is historically correct. It's supported by archaeology and even science and, and reason, then uh, I would hope that you w would be willing to say, well, it, it's, it's been proven to be true, so I, therefore I can no longer reject it. Um, I, let me just get your thoughts on, on that before I read any further, Brother Joe. Yeah, I, I just, I want people to realize that, that uh, Christianity is, is not a blind faith. It, you know, faith is an evidence. It's not the evidence. And and, uh, and and faith being an evidence is something that, that people should look at. Why does this person believe so strongly in what he believes, that he's willing to lay his life down, willing to change his life, willing to uh, be transformed by this faith? So... It's not the evidence, but it's an evidence, and, and people need to, to take that into account, especially when you look back at historical figures uh, who were reputable and, and uh, substantial and willing to die for, for what they believe. 
So, so that their faith is an and evidence, but it's not blind faith. We also have historicity, and we have uh, archaeology for uh, material backup. There's just a lot of evidence that that can be looked at, and and much of it's been discussed already uh, in this book. It, you know, dealing with atheists and agnostics uh, as much as I have. I find that one of the things that they do is they try to, like Luke was saying, they try to use credentials to defeat your argument. In other words, if they have a doctorate in uh, physics or engineering or mathematics, whatever it may be, they use that to demean an argument without looking at the facts. For instance, let's say a guy with a high school education realizes that, that grass is green. He doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, 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 initials after his name, but he knows the grass is green. And you have someone with a ton of uh, credentials who, who disputes that fact. Well, you know, the guy without any education could very well be the one who sees things clearly, and the, the person with all the credentials could be colorblind. So uh, we don't want to demean an argument based on the credentials of the person making the ar argument, rather on Let's base it on the facts of the argument. Uh, a little bit of knowledge is uh, sometimes more of a hindrance than a help to someone in, in determining the truth. Back to you, Luke. All right, thank you. Brother, Brother Ted, your thoughts, please. Well, I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, it seems like every, every few years or so, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned archaeological, just brief archaeological findings, uh, just briefly. I think before in your that last paragraph of your reading. I mean, uh, it seems like you know the historians that want to uh, the, the anti-theists, as you call it, want to debunk the Bible. It seems like the more we find in archaeolog archaeological findings, the last few years, the last few decades, seem to rather than you know uh, dismiss the Bible or debunk the Bible, they end up actually uh, confirming what the Bible says. And uh, one of the most recent ones, you guys might have heard about this already, is there was a cemetery found, a cemetery of the Philistines. And, uh, you know, people think, well, the Philistines, that was, the, you know, the fairy tale of David and Goliath and the, and the, the old story of, uh, you know, Samson. Delilah was a Philistine, you know, but they had findings now that confirmed they found a uh, a Philistine cemetery over there, and it just uh, it was a long uh, excavation process that took years. And uh, one of the last things they found was a Philistine cemetery. So these things, if you look into history, what it's going to do is ended up confirming the Bible rather than debunking the Bible. Uh, you know, I think about 10 years ago they found uh, some findings in the, of the Canaanites, which confirmed maybe why God wanted to have them all destroyed. Uh, they found Canaanite uh, findings regard uh, with the most vile uh, findings, things c confirming that they were into bestiality, they were into child sacrifice, and uh, just terrible things that maybe confirm why they were in such terrible idolatry that God said wipe them out. So these things, these historical finds, archaeological finds, people who really want to look at the history, what they'll find is it confirms things like this, and, and also the evidence, of course, like we're talking about today, confirming the resurrection. I think if people truly look at it, they're going to find that uh, the true scientific evidence and historical evidence is confirming the Bible. So, back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the, uh, we, we've talked uh, already in this study about what faith is. Faith is believing something without having seen it. In fact, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the scripture says that we Christians, we, we walk by faith, not by sight. We've talked quite a bit about the, the value, how much God loves the idea that we will believe in Jesus and his resurrection, even though we weren't eyewitnesses to it. We didn't see it. Um, but the idea of um, um, proving that, that uh, the Bible is true and that Jesus uh, uh, is who he claimed to be and, and uh, not only God but he would pay for our sins and, and he, he 
does have the power over life and death. He exclusively can give you life everlasting in heaven. These claims of Jesus were challenged uh, a lot by the, the Jewish people, the Jewish religious leaders. They did not just accept it because he said it. They demanded proof. They demanded signs. They continually said, what sign will you give us? And that's why he has a long list of, of miracles on his resume. But he has one final miracle that, that he said this will be the, the, the sign that will prove his claims. And that was the resurrection. So we've spent several studies uh, and several chapters in this little book here discussing the resurrection because this is, this is the, uh, the one thing that is, uh, rises above everything else in giving us the proof that, hey, we're not just asking you to believe something just based upon just, you know, faith alone. We're saying your faith can be supported and, and uh, by, by evidence. And he gave us this resurrection as the proof. Uh, I've often talked about when I first got saved, you know, I got saved because I read the scriptures and I believed it. I didn't have anything. All the things in this study, I didn't know any of it. Uh, all of the things that we could go continue to offering as evidence that supports our faith, I didn't have that initially. And, and, and all the experiences that I've had over the last 30 years, the, my own personal experiences with signs and wonders in my life, I didn't have that. And yet when I, when I first believed, I just believed. Don't ask me why, but I believed it was true. And, but then over the period of time, my initial faith has been reinforced and, and supported and proven because of evidence. All right, let me read a little further. Um, another lawyer, Frank Morrison, set out to refute the evidence for the resurrection. He thought that the life of Jesus was one of the most beautiful lives ever lived. But when it came to the resurrection, he thought someone had come along. Oops. Uh, I have a hard time turning the page. He thought someone had come along and tacked a myth onto the story of Jesus. He planned to write an account of the last few days of Jesus. He would, of course, disregard the resurrection. He figured that an intelligent, rational approach to Jesus would completely discount his resurrection. However, upon approaching the facts with his legal background and training, he had to change his mind. He eventually wrote a bestseller titled, Who Moved the Stone? Uh, the first chapter was titled, uh, quote, The Book That Refused to Be Written, unquote. And the rest of the chapters deal decisively uh, with the evidence for Christ's resurrection. Um, I'll read another example here before we get your comments here. George Eldon Ladd concludes, quote, The only rational explanation for these historical facts is that God raised Jesus in bodily form, unquote. A believer in Jesus Christ today can have complete confidence, as did the first Christians, that his faith is based not on myth or legend, but on the solid historical fact of the risen Christ and the empty tomb. Most important of all, the individual believer can experience the power of the risen Christ in his life today. First of all, he can know that his sins are forgiven. Second, he can be assured of eternal life and his own resurrection from the grave. Third, he can be released from a meaningless and empty life and be transformed into a new creature in Jesus Christ. What is your evaluation and decision? What do you think of the empty tomb? After examining the evidence from a judicial perspective, Lord Darling, former Chief Justice of England, concluded that, quote, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true, unquote. That's the end of this chapter. 
chapter 8. We'll continue into chapter 9, but first let me get your thoughts on, on the, what I just read. Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, I really appreciate uh, people like Darling and, and uh, uh, Rainleaf and, and Lewis and, and uh, McDowell because they bring in court-like evidence to examine. And we have to recognize as Christians that uh, we have to recognize that materialism is the prevailing ideology of the world today. Uh, it used to be the prevailing ideology of communist nations, Soviet bloc, and you know, all that stuff where, where religion was outlawed. <clears throat> but today is different. Our generation sees uh, materialistic Darwinism as unquestioned. Even the Pope has has uh, uh, commented that evolution is a fact, and so he's got 1.3 uh, billion of those who call themselves Christian following his lead, uh, and and to deal with someone who has a Darwinistic or materialistic worldview, uh, it, it's impossible to uh, uh, give them this information and have them take it seriously and examine it when they believe there is no uh, God or no spiritual dimension outside of, of Darwinism. And so we've got a, a, a real problem there to get people just to sit down and examine the facts. And this book, even though it's, it's old, it's still here. And, uh, you know, Walter Martin was one of the great apologists of our generation, uh, the three of us here, and he said something uh, that I thought was pretty profound. The, the seeds of reason are watered by the prayer of the saints. And one of the things we have to recognize when we're talking to people is God has to draw them. We've got all oh, we've got we got to plant the seeds, but but they have to they have to have a, a drawing by the Lord, and He would that all men are saved. So they have to respond to a conscience, to a spiritual uh, insight that is ag absolutely diametrically opposed to everything they've been taught. And so it's not such an easy thing to introduce a spiritual element uh, and, and the recognition of a, a spiritual dimension when the whole world uh, is denying that, that possibility. Back to you, Luke. Okay, thank you. Brother Ted, your, your thoughts? Yeah, going on the, on the back of what Joe just said there, you know, as Satan is the god of this world. Uh, the, the Bible says that clearly, and it says that uh, he's blinded the minds of those who don't believe, lest the glorious gospel should shine upon them. And, uh, boy, we need, to, we need to bathe everything we do in prayer. Just, just going out and meeting our day should be bathed in prayer because we don't know who God's going to put in our path. And uh, that one quote from that one historian, I didn't get his name, uh, that, that you quoted there in Josh's book, he, uh, the word that stuck out to me in that quote was rational. And uh, I think anybody who makes use of their reason, use of, use of their rationale, you might say, and rational thinking uh, and true wisdom would have to look at the evidence, and yeah, it's honorable to come to come to God just by faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But I would also say that uh, you know we we kind of uh, uh, laugh at Thomas, uh, but he you know he because he's the one who said, unless I see the prints of the nails in his hands, and uh, put my hand into his side, I'm not, not going to believe. And Jesus said, blessed are those who believe and, and yet haven't seen me. Well, that's all of us. But uh, if anybody makes use of their rational thinking now here post-resurrection in 2016, um, I think anybody who makes use of that and rationale, reason, logic, uh, wisdom, which is given by God, would look at the facts and say, yeah, there's something about Christ. He's an undeniable, undisputable uh, person of history who changed the course of human history more than anybody and there had to be a reason for that for him to be the re the one that changed all of human history um, and that was 
what happened after his resurrection. Human history, I don't believe, would have changed like that. And I don't think the disciples would have lived for a lie. They wouldn't have been rational. <laughs> There's that word again. They wouldn't have been rational to go and preach a dead Christ. Uh, it, it just doesn't fit the whole scope, the whole narrative, if the resurrection's alive. So I know we want to move on, but I'll leave it there, except for saying this. You know, it all boils down to that, and Christ posed the ultimate question when he said, who do you say that I am? And that's the question everybody has to answer, isn't it? So back to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh This uh, this bodily resurrection, uh, as we we've been studying it the last few days again, and as I said, I, I I've given many of these books out over the years. I read it years ago. I've studied his larger versions, and this we've said numerous times. This book's 128 pages, but he has other. This is kind of like a little reader's digest condensed version of his bigger books, evidence that demands a verdict and his follow-up, more evidence that demands a verdict. And those books are probably 800 pages of a full hard, hardback book that's, uh, that's very, very, like, probably 20, 30 times the information we have in here. So there's, there's tons of information that you could, if, if you want the information. But the question is, does someone desire to know the truth? Or are they just have their mind made up, and no matter what, they don't. They're not going to uh, even consider it. Uh, but if if someone desires to know the truth, even if someone desires to prove, disprove the Bible, as we've cited, there's many examples of people that their goal was to disprove it, and so they went along to out to uh, study it. They had to study it, and and, uh, and as they did, they they were persuaded that no, their original skepticism was proven wrong, and I would say that probably most people who are believers started off as skeptics. I mean, maybe sometimes you're brought up in a family, and from your youth, your family believed in the Bible and Jesus, and, and uh, you were brought up that way. There was never any skepticism. But there's a lot of people, though, that uh, uh, they didn't have that kind of upbringing fr from their youth, and so they, they start out as skeptics. And as I said, skepticism is a healthy thing. We otherwise we'd just be gullible fools, just you know, fall for anything. Uh, so, uh, but if you are a skeptic, at least have an open mind. And, and uh, as you study it, you'll find out that, uh, uh, as we have, that the evidence just gives us so much joy because we we say, well, not only uh, am I believed by faith, but now my my faith has been so reinforced with a mountain of evidence. To back it up. All right, let's begin with chapter 9. Uh, the title of this chapter is, Will the Real Messiah Please Stand Up? Jesus had various credentials to support his claims to be the Messiah, God's Son. In this chapter, I want to deal with one credential often overlooked, <clears throat> one of the most profound, the fulfillment of prophecy in his life. Over and over again, Jesus appealed to the prophecies of the Old Testament to substantiate his claims as the Messiah. Galatians 4.4 4 says, quote, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, unquote. Here we have reference to the prophecies being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Quote, and beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained uh, to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures, unquote. That's Luke 24, 27. Jesus said to them, quote, These are my words uh, which I spoke to you uh, while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, unquote. Uh, he said, quote, <clears throat> for if you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. That's John 5, 46. He said, quote, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, unquote. 
the, uh, that's uh, John 8.56. The apostles, the New Testament writers, etc., constantly appeal to fulfill the names of Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah. Quote, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And that's Acts 3, verse 18. <clears throat> Quote, and according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, quote, This Jesus, who I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ, unquote. <clears throat> That's Acts 17, 2 and 3. For, for, quote, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, Christ's death was prophesied in the Old Testament, and that he was buried, and that, he, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. All right, Brother Joe, what are your thoughts on that? Well, here is a really, really good part of the book. And I haven't reread this part that I remember, but this has the Old Testament. Now, we're talking from 1,600 years prior, uh, the prophets of Israel started testifying of, uh, and, and prophesying on the Messiah that was to come. So for us to believe that those prophecies uh, were merely uh, fulfilled by a intentional design of man, we have to believe, number one, that Mary and Joseph got together and they said, hey, guess what? One of the prophecies from 1600 years ago was that the Messiah would be crucified on a, on, a, on, a, uh, on, on wood. Now, the Romans have since invented crucifixion. It's a good time to have a baby and make sure it's a male and it's unattractive, and we're going to try to fulfill 360 of the prophecies so at the end he can be crucified by this new method that's been invented by the Romans. This is awesome. Let's, let's, let's uh, have a Messiah. That's how it had to start. Uh, and uh, if you look at the 360 prophecies, uh, number one, they're going to have to go to Bethlehem to have the son. And then they're going to have to make sure that the, uh, the current king of Israel decides to slaughter all the newborns to try to get rid of him. They have to send word to uh, some people in another country to follow a star to find the Messiah. Lots of work to be done for those guys, uh, setting up the, the prophecies to be fulfilled, uh, including uh, convincing the nation of Israel to welcome, at, welcome him as the Messiah one day, and then uh, request he be crucified the next. Uh, if Mary and Joseph arranged all this, they were tricky uh, kids indeed at age 13 and 16. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, all right. And Brother Ted. Well, Joe stole a little of my thunder there uh, when he was talking about, uh, you know, when Christ had to come. And I love how you quoted uh, there Galatians uh, 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of his sons. You know, Christ, uh, like Joe was saying, Christ showed up at just the right time in just the right place. The thing about it being just the right time the fullness of time, you think about that, the Pharisees were on the scene. Uh, you know, we had a 400-year period from the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, uh, beginning of Christ's ministry, where there was a 400-year time of, of, of silence where God wasn't speaking to any prophets that we know of, and they were just waiting. They were awaiting, awaiting, awaiting uh, God to make his next move. Galatians 4.4 is huge. Uh, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. The Pharisees were on the scene. Uh, you know, God knew their mindsets. He knew their, uh, that they were just a, a generation of vipers. Um, and, uh, of course, that 
like Joe said, that Christ had to be born in Bethlehem. So he was born at the right time when the scoundrels would betray him to the Roman uh, authorities, which, of course, now, as Joe also said, had the means of execution. The means of execution at that time was piercing hands and feet, wasn't it? So, um, you know, truly, truly, I mean, how is this going to be contrived and fulfilled deliberately? Uh, it can only be fulfilled by God putting Christ right there on that scene with those people at that time in the fullness of time. That's the only way it could have happened. This, this is why Christ is the real Messiah. This is why he stands alone. So uh, back to you. Hmm. Well, uh, I keep on talking about how powerful this little book is. It's only 128 pages, and yet there's so much um, uh, power and importance impact into it. Uh, we talked about uh, in the previous chapters about uh, why we thought that the the scriptures were reliable and trustworthy, and the the, man, the manuscript evidence for it. We uh, we talked about the uh, the lives of the apostles, how they were changed uh, from cowards to to uh, martyrs overnight because of this resurrection. We talked about the uh, the proofs for the resurrection and the, the silly arguments against it, how absurd they are. Uh, and now we're talking now we're talking about. Now we're talking about um, uh, uh, biblical prophecies, and uh, I think Josh McDowell has really done an excellent job selecting these categories of things that are, are so important that gives us confidence that the scriptures are true, that uh, Jesus is who he claimed to be and did what the scriptures claim he did. That these are the things that give us so much confidence in, in our faith. Uh, but the the prophecy part, we, I know that we mentioned it once earlier. Where I, I think I made this point already, but uh, the, in the beginning we talked about how the Bible is historically correct. It's a history book. And, and nothing nothing can be shown in the Bible that is historically incorrect. And people sometimes think there's a historical error, and then maybe centuries later, some archaeological discovery is made, and they realize, oh, wait a second, uh, we thought the Bible had it wrong, and it turns out it was right after all. So the Bible is 100% historically correct, but it's not only a history book of past events, it's a history of future events, because so much of what happened in the Bible it, the, it, the history was recorded before it happened. Sometimes just you know years and decades, sometimes hundreds, uh, even even uh, a thousand years. Uh, uh, David's prophecies were a thousand years before Jesus. Uh, Isaiah's prophecies were 700 years before before Jesus. <laughs> And so it's a history of past events, but some of it is his, history written in advance. And what we're going to see in this chapter as we go along, and you've cited some of these examples, but there's so much more, is that the Bible tells us what's going to happen in the future. And it's so clear. It's not like the prophecies of Nostradamus or Gene Dixon, and, because they, we can see that they, they have been inaccurate and their, their predictions and prophecies are vague, uh, but the Bible is clear and specific and 100% accurate in all of, its all of its prophecies. And that's what tells us. We can only come to one conclusion. Who can tell right down the future 100% correct all the time? Only God. And the fact that's a test, the Bible says that's a test of a true prophet is that he can never be wrong. Uh, so... Um, because of these prophecies in the Bible, it tells us this this is more than just a history book. It's the Word of God. It's God breathed. Um, I uh, okay. I I don't. I guess I'll continue reading a little further then before I get your thoughts. Here. It says, uh, "Where did I stop? Oh yeah, in the Old Testament." There are 60 major messianic uh, prophecies and approximately 270 
ramifications that were fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ. It is helpful to look at all these predictions fulfilled in Christ as his, quote, address, unquote. You've probably never realized how important the details of your name and address are. And yet, these details set you apart from the four billion. Well, <laughs> you can see how long ago this book was written. I think we have six, maybe seven billion population on planet Earth now. Uh, it says, yet these details set you apart from the four billion other people who also inhabit this planet. planet. Um, I, before I get your thoughts, I better read a little further to give you more to respond to. It says, an, an address in history. With even greater detail, God wrote an, quote, address, unquote, in history to single out his son, the Messiah, the Savior of mankind. From anyone who has ever lived in history, past, present, and future, the specifics of this address can be found in the Old Testament. A document written over a period of 1,000 years, uh, which contains over 300 references to his coming, using the science of probability, we find the chances of just 48 of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person to be only one in 10 to the 157th power. Brother John? Yeah, I don't know uh, if if uh, the people viewing this uh, know what that means. <laughs> that number is uh, is is staggering. Uh, it, it many 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 times uh, uh, is past what science would accept as as irrefutable, but by thousands of times. Uh, you know, we have uh, something called facial recognition software right now and uh, at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium let's say if you're going in for a game everyone's face is scanned looking for people on terrorist watch lists and uh, they can see within seconds uh, scouring the millions and millions of faces that have been put in the database uh, if anybody walks in who, who uh, is a, a threat but we're old school here we're, we're all over 40 50 right so, uh, Ted, I don't want to make any assumptions. I don't know how old you are. But we, uh, we think more along the lines of fingerprints. Well, we've gone through the fingerprints of everybody who has ever lived, and we've found the creator of the universe. And uh, so vivid and so exact is the fingerprint, uh, it's unquestionable. Right? Now, going by memory, the number that, that you said, the, the calculation you made, it's kind of like filling the entire universe with quarters and putting a mark on one quarter, mixing them all up, and having someone reach into the universe and pick out that quarter with a mark on it. That's the probability uh, that, that there could be a mistake. So <clears throat> absolutely unquestionable fingerprint of the creator of the universe. And so uh, uh, just staggering. I had something else to say, but I don't remember what it was. I, was, I got caught up in that number. Back to you. Um, well, very good, Brother Joe, but see, this is something here that might, you might find helpful here. See this? This, this here? Next time you have something to say, just make a little note. I find it to be very helpful. Brother Ted? I'm going to make a note that you said that, Luke. Luke. Luke is just so merciful, man, and gracious, isn't he? It's like... See the thing, uh, Sam. You've been you've been duped into this, and you you know uh, you didn't think that those of us who are grace teachers, you know, initiate members into these hangouts, and then and then it turns into hazing. Remember hazing from college? That's that's what's happened to you now. Uh, no, and just in regards to the prophecies fulfilled, I mean, I know I don't have a copy of the book in front of me, uh, and I'm sure McDowell gets into all these. But just, just to rattle off a few that are here in the back of my Bible, uh, the prophetic scripture, the subject of it, you know, uh, of the seed of a woman, women don't have seed, men have seed. So right there, you know, uh, the, opening, the opening testimony of scripture 
where God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, but, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a death blow to the enemy, to the, uh, to, to, to the serpent, uh, to the devil. But there's only a, a temporary blow to the Messiah there. And uh, I'm going to skip over some of the, uh, some of the fulfilled prophecies, because I know this chapter that McDowell's probably into is going to get into that. But one of the things is, um, that I found is, is awesome is uh, one of the uh, scriptures, one of the uh, uh, prophecies is that he would be foretold, foretold by, by a forerunner. And that, of course, was John the Baptist, Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So right in front of Christ we had a forerunner. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, John the Baptist we know is that forerunner, and without getting into all the passages, this is one passage that's always amazed me once I discovered what John said about Christ. And because, you know, every it, it's in within human nature to doubt, even though John the Baptist probably knew, or at least... Uh, by the Spirit, was led to testify to Israel. He was the one crying in the wilderness. And uh, in John 1.29, John said this, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. Well, what does that have to do with anything, John? Uh, well, how would that make you know him? Look what it says right here. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but, and here it is, he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And I don't want to go on preaching here, but I do want to say that, listen, not only do we have the written, uh, uh, the prophetic nature of the Scriptures foretold, but here we have something that John said, this is a visual fulfillment of what was written down. You have that which was written, and John said, this is something actually visible that I am seeing and I'm testifying well, you know, every time John probably dumped somebody or however they did baptism back then, whether it was pouring or whatever, John's thinking, is this the one? Is this the one? And this one? No. And when the Spirit descended like a dove, John said, this is the fulfillment of what God said to me. And it just further testifies that this is the Christ. This is the Lamb of God. So there's one more thing that fulfills and all points to Christ. And I'll stop preaching here. I'll let you go. Hmm. All right. Well, um, the, the the book is going to do a better job than any of us could do in, in terms of listing the, all these prophecies, and, and it's only going to actually touch on a, a portion of them of of the 300 plus. But um, it, I think the point that he's going to make will be pretty profound when people uh, understand this. But I, I want to just comment about this point of uh, oh, it says the number is one. In ten, now one chance out of ten, everybody understands that, you know. Uh, and, but this is one out of ten with 157 zeros following it. Imagine a number with you got one and then 157 zeros after it. That number is so big that with there, there's no no number, there's no name for it. Like millions, billions, quadrillions, trillions, and so on. The number, the, I don't think there's a number for that. That's why they got to just describe the number in that way. One, one in ten to the one hundred and fifty seventh power. Um, so the number is is so big that he's going to even take a smaller sampling, uh, and that's only as he said. 48 of the over 300. I think he reduces it even maybe even a little further too, um, in terms of the number of prophecies that he's going to cite and use in this formula. But the uh, these statistical probabilities are, are really powerful. Uh, we know that uh, 
the, the example that Joe gave in facial recognition, I, I guess that they have certain uh, measuring points and various features. Maybe there's a dozen or several dozen measuring points, and they, they can match those up and prove uh, with, uh, with certainty the identity of somebody. Um, there's also the fingerprint that people accept as a as a certainty when if because they say there's no two alike I'm not sure that they can prove that there's no two exactly alike but they, they consider it a test of, of authenticity the fingerprint and now we also know that the DNA is being used as a, as a infallible identification marker um, um, so um, the, the idea of uh, identifying the right person through these means is, is very powerful and reliable. And in this case, he's going to show the mathematical probabilities of, it, of, it, of this uh, promised Messiah being anybody apart from Jesus. So we'll continue, continue on looking at this number and the, the meaning of it. It says, the task of matching up God's address with one man is further complicated by the fact that all the prophecies of the Messiah were made at least 400 years before he was to appear. Some might disagree and say that these prophecies were written down after the time of Christ and fabricated to coincide with his life. This might sound feasible until you realize that the Septuagint the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament was translated around 150 to 200 BC. This Greek translation shows that there was at least a 200 year gap between the prophecies being recorded and their fulfillment in Christ. Certainly God was writing an address in history that only the Messiah could fulfill. There have been approximately 40 major claims by men to be the Jewish Messiah, but only one, Jesus Christ, appealed to fulfill prophecy to substantiate his claims, and only his credentials backed up those claims. I'll pause, I'll pause there, but also make a brief comment about this before we go to Joe, that uh, Jesus did appeal to prophecies. He said while he... Uh, in, during his carnation, during his, his uh, ministry, he cited prophecies. This is done so that the, the prophecy is fulfilled. When he first started his ministry, he read out of the scriptures and said, today this prophecy is fulfilled. And, and then also, after his resurrection, he walked down the road to Emmaus and talked to two disciples and, and he it says that he reviewed all the prophecies in the Old Testament with him, showing that uh, these are the, the, what it said about the Messiah and that Jesus fulfilled them all. So Jesus uh, used prophecies to prove his identity. And Paul also had that custom. Every time he went into a new town, he would first thing go into the, uh, the synagogues and talk to the Jews and go through the scriptures pointing out the prophecies about Jesus and that showing that Jesus had fulfilled these prophecies. Uh, so Brother Joe, your thoughts? Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank here. It's it's undeniable proof. Uh, you know that I've talked to uh, a lot of atheists. Uh, I would say probably, well, at least many dozens, if not hundreds, over the years. And when presented with enough evidence, uh, they fall back on a conspiracy. And uh, the conspiracy had to have been uh, largely initiated and, and uh, led by a 13-year-old girl. Uh, <laughs> she might have pulled one or two off. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's undeniable. Uh, I'm drawing a blank, so I'm going to defer to Ted. Uh, yeah, the, uh, Josh McDowell, I recall in this book, he does address the, this question of, uh, is it possible that this could have been manipulated? And he's going to show that there's a lot of these prophecies that it's impossible for uh, it to be like uh, self-determined. Okay, brother, brother Ted. Well, I'll just say real quick that um, it goes back to what you've said before, Luke, and that is, you know, God writes history in advance. I mean, that's it. Even uh, even those who are supposed believers, uh, remember Jesus said to the uh, 
the disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection. Uh, he opened the scriptures to them, opened, tell, told them, told them. And then I believe he said, he, I think it's to those, he said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the, the scriptures have said, you know, uh, all that was written. So, I mean, uh, God wrote this, God wrote these prophecies in advance so they would know. And uh, Christ came and fulfilled those scriptures, those prophecies, so that an unbelieving world would know. And that's what God does. God writes history in advance so that we can know that these things are true about Christ. Back to you. Yeah, the, the, the prophecies were given for a reason. Even, even uh, there is a verse in the Old Testament where God says, um, uh, challenge me and, and uh, I'll, I'll, pr I'll prove it to you uh, because what I'll do is I'll tell you what's going to happen in the future. And, and this will be the proof that I, I am God because only God can tell you absolutely correctly. I mean, anybody can make, make random guesses and, and occasionally be right. But uh, to write, to tell us exactly what's going to happen in great detail over and over again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and never fail, then God says, this is the, the if, you, if you have any kind of intelligence, you know that that's impossible unless, unless it's God speaking. Um, so, I hope, I'm not sure I can... Remember where I left off here. Let me see if uh, this sounds familiar. Uh, certainly, God was writing an address in history that only the Messiah could fulfill. There have been approximately 40 major claims by men to be the Jewish Messiah, but only one, Jesus Christ, appealed to fulfill prophecy to substantiate his claims, and only his credentials back up those claims. What were some of those details? and what events had to precede and coincide with the appearance of God's Son? To begin, we need to go way back to Genesis 3.15. Here we have the first messianic prophecy. In all of Scripture, only one man was, quote, born of the seed of a woman, unquote. And all others are born of the seed of a man. Here is one who will come into the world and undo the works of Satan, quote, bruise his head, unquote. In Genesis 9 and 10, God narrowed the address down further. Well, first let me, well, let me stop before I go on and get your thoughts on that one. Uh, Brother Ted commented on this before. But Brother Joe, your thoughts on that first prophecy? Uh, I'm not sure who you wanted to go first, uh, Luke. Yeah, Brother Joe, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, like I said, these prophecies go back 1,600 years, and yeah, that the, they could not have been written uh, prior to the 400 years or, or or whatever it was before Christ, uh, if they wanted to if they wanted to claim a manipulation of text. Still, uh, it makes no difference. It was generations and generations, generations removed. So, and and then also uh, this this thing about being uh, uh, the seed of a woman. There, there's wider implications to be explored here, but uh, I will say that it also gave the exact lineage. It would be through the seed of David, and uh, and Mary uh, also fulfilled that prophecy, and uh, that would be. <laughs> that's something you you know they, they were very careful to uh, document lineage back then, and family was everything, especially within uh, the the nation of Israel. So, just another undeniable proof, Luke. All right, thank you, Brother Ted. You want to talk any further about that first prophecy? No, I think it, I think it's it's evident that it was fulfilled in Christ, and uh, nobody else in human history has stepped up to the plate. That's uh, that's fulfilled that uh, and the others. So back to you. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll make a comment on, on it. Uh, the this, this seed of a woman could only happen if there's no man's, no male seed uh, used for conception, and that's what we have with a virgin birth. With a, with a, the Bible tells us that 
that the Holy Spirit uh, came over Mary and she conceived. There was no um, um, human male that um, gave her the, the seed as, as is the, the normal way. That has been the case in all other people. Um, this one was without the male contributing a seed. Now this was uh, the, the virgin birth is one of the things that was prophesied in the Old Testament and uh, it's not only said that born of a virgin specifically there's there's a verse that says will be born of a virgin but this first prophecy when it says the seed of a woman that's really what it's really referring to that there's no male seed contributing to the conception and I, I don't hold a necessarily a strong position on this this is what I'm saying next but you might not agree uh, but uh, I've heard it taught that the, um, the this sinfulness that we inherit, the, the genetic defect that we're, we have a sin uh, inherently in us uh, at birth, Jesus, the scriptures say, was born without sin. And uh, and how is that possible? Well, it's because the, that is inherited through the male seed. And, and uh, that's how this is passed down to, to all of us. And so that's why it was necessary for there to be no male seed contributing to his his birth, otherwise this sinfulness that was, we all are born with is uh, would be also attributed to Jesus. Uh, okay, I'm going to go on, but anything you want to say anything about that? Well, it's it's, it's one of the more difficult things <clears throat> to uh, to address to to the non-believer or especially to the skeptic. Skeptic, uh, they're going to say, listen. Uh, he, they're just saying that, that she was a virgin. Obviously, uh, uh, she had uh, sex with a male, and obviously this is just a, a prophecy that you can't prove. And uh, and I and I don't have a, a way to definitively prove it other than to look at the weight of all the evidence and then to uh, go back to this and say, well, the weight of all the evidence uh, shows that this one, while we have no way to prove what's being said here, uh, is true. So it's one of those things that we accept by faith after examining evidence as a whole. Uh, otherwise, you know, there's there's really no way to prove that to uh, the skeptic uh, individually. So this one prophecy is unlike most prophecies in that uh, we don't have any any uh, controvertible evidence uh, to substantiate that. You know, there wasn't a lie told on this one. So it's one of the hardest ones to prove until you look at everything as a whole. All right, thanks. Brother Brother Ted, any more on this before I move on? No, other than uh, I think that the, the address, the scripture you're looking for is uh, Isaiah 7.14. Um, I haven't pulled that up yet, but I think that's the one about a virgin shall conceive and be with child. And uh, then it goes on to give all the titles of Christ. But uh, now it had, had to be miraculous like that. As far as your uh, position on the uh, sin issue passed from the, uh, from the male, I think we should probably open that up of, of another topic uh, regarding the sin nature, which we've, I think, maybe told some of the audience we're going to do. But uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Isaiah 7.14 uh, is the passage I think we're looking for. And uh, uh, besides Genesis 3, uh, as promised, be from the seed of the woman. So back to you. All right. Uh, I'll continue reading. It says, in Genesis 9 and 10, God narrowed the address down further. Noah had three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. Today, all of the nations of the world can be traced back to these three men. But in this statement, God effectively eliminated two-thirds of them from the line of Messiahship. The Messiah will come through the lineage of Shem. Uh, then, continuing on down to the year 2000 BC, we find God calling a man named Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, with Abraham, God be uh, became still more specific, stating that the Messiah will be one of his descendants. All the families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. Uh, when Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, 
many of Abraham's descendants were eliminated when God selected his second son, Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and then God chose the line of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, out of whom developed the 12 tribes of Israel. Then God singled out the tribe of Judah for Messiahship and eliminated 11 twelfths of the Israelite tribes. And of all the family lines within Judah's tribe, the line of Jesse was the divine choice. One can see the probability building. Uh, there's more. It'll continue on in this line of thought, but uh, let me just get your thoughts on that, Brother Joe. Yeah, it, the, the, in this part uh, of the Bible, you know, people say, oh, it's so boring how it goes over who begat who and who begat who and they begat them. You know, the lineage uh, is amazing because uh, every significant generation uh, is is narrowed in on, like you were pointing out, uh, until uh, the time of Christ. I mean, it's really mind-blowing uh, because there'd be so many ways to contraindicate the facts of the lineage of Christ if there was one chink in that armor. And, uh, and they made so many connections that you can follow the lineage to the point where in it, there's no no one can dispute that Mary was of the line of David, and uh, so it's just amazing uh, to me, and and not boring at all to to uh, uh, read over the lineages of Christ that are that are recorded, and God did that for a reason, uh, so that we wouldn't have to have blind faith, and so that the Pharisees would have no reason to doubt if they were actually interested in in searching out whether he was the Messiah. Back to you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, Brother Ted? Yeah, I think I think it's just echoing what both of you have said. Uh, it's it's process of elimination. It's of eliminating anybody else that could come along and uh, claim to be the Messiah or or be claimed by someone else from out you know an outside source uh, to be claimed the Messiah. It's the process of elimination. And uh, it's you know it's narrowing it down to who it would be prophecy after prophecy and uh, the lineage and the genealogies of, of the certain tribes and certain people the son of the son of and uh, and, it, and it was all to point to Jesus as being that one who would fulfill so just affirming what you guys are saying back to you hmm. yeah now personally I, I read the Bible for Bible from cover to cover numerous times and I've often told people that when you start to read the Bible uh, I don't really advise people to start from the beginning and, and, and read it as you would a normal book uh, until first you have um, so um, um, ingrained the book of John and then the writings of Paul once you've got John gospel and then Paul's uh, epistles once you've got those down and you've read them over and over and over again only then I think are you should you even attempt to read the Bible from Genesis 1 1 through Revelation uh, but but if, when you do read through uh, the Bible in order you're going to find there are large portions of pages that are just this person begot that person, and this person begot that person, and and um, if you don't understand what's what's uh, the reason it's there, you can wonder. This is kind of boring, and you you want to do speed reading through, over that portion and just skim over it, uh, not realizing the significance of it. But these genealogies are there for this very purpose, for this whole conversation we're having now, showing that prophecy saying that this Messiah. Will be come from uh, Shem, Shem's family, uh, Abraham's, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, on and on. And each 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 prophecy that names this person, this line, eliminates the rest of the world. And, and that's why this is so important. And, and and he's going to make the draw this conclusion very well in the book, better than than I could do. But I'll read a little further now. Um, it says, um, Jesse had eight children, and in 2 Samuel 
7, 12 through 16, and Jeremiah 23, 5, God eliminated seven-eighths of, of Jesse's family line. We read that God's man will not only be the seed of a woman, the lineage of Shem, the race of the Jews, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, but that he will also be of the house of David. A prophecy uh, dating uh, 1012 BC also predicts that this man's hands and feet will be pierced, such as he will be crucified. This description was written 800 years before crucifixion was put into effect by the Romans. Isaiah 7.14 adds that he will be born, well let me, let me before I go on, that's a good place to get your thoughts. Brother Joe? My, my thoughts are that uh, every generation that's listed, uh, now they listed every significant uh, uh, milepost in the lineage and it's fa there's a fascinating story in looking through the the ancestry of Christ uh, you know I mean you can look at Rahab uh, who was a prostitute wasn't she I believe uh, who was brought into that line uh, there, there's all kinds of symbolism and fulfillment of prophecy even before Christ in getting to the point of Christ and so the prophecy is voluminous from the beginning to the end. And uh, absolutely no way it could be manipulated. Back to you, Luke. All right. Thank you. Brother Chad? Well, no, nothing to add to that. Just just a hearty amen to these. Uh, I just want to say that these prophecies are building on each other. And uh, they're pointing pointing, pointing, pointing to the one who would come. And uh, just, uh, I'll let you carry on with the book because I think he's building a case. Uh, I like the, the title of Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. That, that's what he does. He just builds the evidence that it could only be the one person, the Lord Jesus. So back to you. Well, uh, I think somebody mentioned it be this point before, and now Lee Strobel has mentioned it. And I, I think it's worth repeating again the fact that the Bible says that he would, his hands and feet would be pierced and we find this I believe it's in Isaiah 53 if not it's in Psalm 22 where this um, there's detailed description of the Messiah and uh, describing him and everything that would happen to him including his death and how he would die and his hands and feet would be pierced as a means of killing him and then before the Romans invented crucifixion uh, and this was uh, no one would have any idea what what pot, what he could possibly be talking about. Uh, um, so predicting a, a form of death, a type of execution that didn't even exist, uh, is, is certainly to me a very powerful uh, uh, proof that, that God is saying he's going to be killed in, in, in this way, and yet that was not even thought of as a means of execution. Uh, at that time, 800 years prior to the invention of uh, crucifixion. I'll read a little further. Isaiah 7.14 adds that he will be born of a virgin, a natural birth of unnatural conception, a criterion beyond human planning and control. Several prophecies recorded in Isaiah and the Psalms describe the social climate and response that God's man will encounter. His own people, the Jews, will reject him, and the Gentiles will believe in him. There will be a forerunner for him. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, verse 1. A voice in the wilderness, one preparing the way before the Lord, uh, a John the Baptist. So we're seeing that all of these prophecies, uh, they were written hundreds, maybe thousand years before these things actually happened. Uh, or, or Jesus uh, fits the description of each one of these. And so you are going to see his, this is going to come to a crescendo. And uh, the 
when you look at the mathematical probabilities, it becomes beyond any any dispute that it, that uh, Jesus is the one the prophecies were talking about. Well, I'll, I'll let me pause there before I go into the thirty pieces of silver, uh, Brother Joe. Yeah, I I, I think that uh, skeptics and atheists who, who uh, seek to uh, make assumptions uh, in in uh, discrediting Scripture. Are are doing that? They're they're making assumptions. Uh, they don't really seek out evidence and address the evidence. When you mention any of these facts to the average uh, evangelical atheist, uh, they're going to counter with what? <laughs> what are you talking about? They haven't examined the evidence. They don't know any of these facts. Uh, they're basing their uh, uh, derision of scripture on assumptions and and assumptions that they haven't even thought out that well uh, so uh, you know people are not that clever I mean you know I especially in genealogies there's there's no way I'll give you an example. my daughter Lindsay when she was four uh, she came up to me and she said dad let me get this straight your mother is my grandma really how can this be you know people just aren't you know aren't that bright where they can actually look into the future and manipulate facts on genealogies it's just impossible and uh, and and another thing if, if this these stories were made up wouldn't they be done better you know John is called the greatest of all prophets and yet he's the only prophet recorded in Scripture who never did a miracle all he did was proclaiming the coming Christ, the coming Messiah. That's all he did. And no miracles, nothing to make him bolstered or, or pedestalized. He was just a guy in a, in a nasty uh, bit of clothing who lived in the desert. And so uh, to me, that's, that's just more fodder for uh, uh, the authenticity of Scripture. Thank you, Luke. Oh, that's a very interesting observation about uh, John the Baptist. I considered that. Brother Ted? I just wanted to say a hearty amen to what Joe said. I mean, um, the people that uh, are, as you call them, Luke, the, the anti-theists, I think is your term for them, is that's, that's really fitting because uh, uh, it, it seems to me like the more we go through this lesson, the more evidence that we're getting presented in this and like you said, this book is a thumbnail sketch of some of the other other evidence and works that uh, McDowell and others have done. It seems like uh, what's the expression? Uh, the the anti-theists and and the ones who are derisive towards the things of God and the things of Scripture is you know they're going into the situation eyes wide shut. I think maybe that's it. Uh, it's it's got to be some kind of willful ignorance that, that just doesn't want to look at the facts. That's that's the way. Uh, it seems like the way it has to be. So, uh, otherwise, if they if they would look at it, would consider those things, I think the the evidence is overwhelming. So, back to you. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll read further. Uh, notice too the seven ramifications of a prophecy that narrows the drama down even further. Here God indicates that the Messiah will, number one, be betrayed, two, by a friend, three, for 30 pieces, four, of silver, and that it will be, five, cast on the floor, number six, of the temple, number seven, used to buy a potter's field. <laughs> In all of that is part of one prophecy. There's seven uh, seven elements of that one prophecy. Uh, in Micah 5.2, God eliminated all the cities of the world and selected Bethlehem with less than 1,000 people as the Messiah's birthplace. Then, through a series of prophecies, he even defined the time sequence that would uh, set his man apart. For example, Malachi 3.1, and, and four other Old Testament verses require the Messiah to come while the temple of Jerusalem is still standing. 
This is of great significance when we realize that the temple was destroyed in AD 70 and has not since been rebuilt. The entire, no, no, the, the precise lineage, the place, time, and manner of birth, people's reactions, the betrayal, the manner of death, these are just a fragment of the hundreds of details that made up the address to identify God's Son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Okay, um, okay there, he's going to consider uh, or the, an objection to this line of thinking next, but first let me just get your thoughts on that. Brother Joe? Yeah, I, I, uh, I had a discussion with a, a very good friend, who is anti-theist, and uh, and he responded, and I and I not so eloquently put out these facts. I mean, I, I I had a portion of what you just read in my mind at that time, and I put those to him uh, to get his response to how that could be a conspiracy, and knowing that there is no rebuttal, you know what his response to me was? His response was. You really believe that Noah put on two animals of each kind into a big ship? And what about the dinosaur bones? And that that was the response. Hey, back to you, Luke. Yeah, it is mind-boggling. I'm holding back my thoughts on uh, to answer that kind of an attitude. I'm trying to. I have something I want to say, but I'm holding back. I think till a little later, Brother Ted. Yeah, I, I have no comment other than to say that's a perfect example of uh, of my slogan: uh, "People who want truth get truth; people who don't won't." The guy—it sounds like the guy completely avoided the issue and the evidence. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, the subtitle for this portion says "Objection." Such fulfilled prophecy was coincidental. Quote, why, you could find some of these prophecies fulfilled in Kennedy, King, Nasser, etc., unquote, replies a critic. Yes, one could possibly find one or two prophecies fulfilled in other men, but not all 60 major prophecies and 270 ramifications. In fact, if you can find someone other than Jesus, either living or dead, who can fulfill only half of the predictions concerning Messiah, which are given in Messiah in both, uh, both Testaments by, uh, Fred, by Fred John Meldow, the Christian Victory Publishing Company of Denver is ready to give you a $1,000 reward. Uh, I think you have a reward, don't you, Brother Ted, too? You can tell us about that, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, H. Harold Hartzler of the American Scientific Affiliation, in the foreword of a book by Peter W. Stoner, writes, quote, The manuscript for Science Speaks has carefully reviewed by a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation members and by the executive council of the same group and has been found in general to be dependable and accurate in regard to the scientific material presented. The mathematical analysis included is based upon principles of probability which are thoroughly sound and Professor Stoner has applied these principles in a proper and convincing way. The following probabilities are taken from that book to show that coincidence is ruled out by the science of probability. Stoner says that by using the modern science of probability in reference to eight prophecies, quote, we find that the chance that any man might have lived down to the present time and fulfilled all eight prophecies is one in ten to the seventeenth power. Again, that's a one with seventeen zeros after it. 
we don't have a, a name like millions and billions and trillions. We don't even have a name for that number. It's so large. So we have to describe it a one with 17 zeros after it. That would be one in, well, he has all the zeros there. <clears throat> um, in order to help us comprehend this staggering probability, Stoner illustrates it <clears throat> by supposing that we take 10 to the 17th silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all the state two feet deep. Now, mark one of these silver dollars and stir the whole mass thoroughly over all the state. Blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wishes, <clears throat> but he must pick up one silver dollar and say that this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote them in their own wisdom. Quote, now these prophecies were either given by inspiration of God or the prophets just wrote them as they thought they should be. In such a case, the prophets had just one chance in 10 to the 17th of having them come true in any man, but they all came true in Christ. Quote, this means that the fulfillment of these eight prophecies alone proves that God inspired the writing of these prophecies to a definiteness, which lacks only one chance in 10 to the 17th of being absolute, unquote. Brother Joe? Well, they, they say that the DNA evidence is... Uh... 99.9% accurate when it's done to the furthest extent that science can, can uh, bring it to that detail. So if a DNA test is done uh, as good as we can do it, uh, we say that it's 99.9% .9 accurate. Well, there's 7 billion people in the, uh, in the world today, and so that would be uh, short of one with 12 zeros. Uh, so when you start adding those extra zeros, every one uh, is exponential. So uh, it, it just brings me back to the point that anti-theists or anti-scriptural uh, opponents, they don't look at the evidence. They can't. Uh, they can't. If they go into a courtroom and say this DNA matches this person, they're very quick to accept it. Uh, and the scriptural evidence on these prophecies, just the eight, are way more than twice. Uh, I, I'm not that great at math, but uh, the exponential of from uh, 12 zeros to 17 is, uh, what, uh, five times greater. So, uh, yeah, it's just mind-boggling that people can't accept uh, facts. Yeah, brother. Yeah, I don't think your math is that good. Just from what you said there, as far as uh, how you did the comparison, I think it's much, much more than five. I don't, I don't know either. I'm, I'm probably no better at, at math than, than you are. But it is mind-boggling. Uh, I've heard it said that the chances of just a certain number of these prophecies is exceeds the number of, of uh, atoms in the in the entire universe. And you know, it, it's another way of illustrating this. Uh, if we look at the larger number of the fulfilled prophecies. Uh, so it, it defies just, it's just belligerent for anybody to, to uh, not accept this as, as a fact. Brother Ted? Well, I use the word mind-boggling, and that's what I was going to say. Uh, uh, I mean, the mathematical, the probability, the likelihood that it was anybody else but Jesus Christ of Nazareth is, is not even infinitesimal it's it's basically non-existence and the and the likelihood that it is him is is overwhelming and uh, no I was never good in math either so <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over back to you 
well, we, we have the, the likelihood that it's him. The, the, I would call it the certainty that uh, this, this prophecies were written about this particular person we know as uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. We know that to a certainty the prophecies were written about him. Uh, but the fact that the, they were able to predict with such precision uh, so many uh, decades and centuries before that tells us that the, the Bible is the Word of God. There's no, no other way that this could have been recorded so far in advance with great detail unless God put it in the mouth of the prophets and put it in the pen. Uh, I'll read a little further. Uh, there's only one last, let me see, on this chapter there's only one page left. So it says, another objection. Another objection is that Jesus deliberately attempted to fulfill the Jewish prophecies. This objection seems plausible until we realize that many of the details of the Messiah's coming <clears throat> were totally beyond human control. For example, the place of birth. Uh, I, I can just hear Jesus in, in Mary's womb as she rode on the donkey, quote, Mom, we won't make it, unquote. <laughs> Herod when Herod asked the chief priests and scribes, quote, where is the Christ to be born, unquote, they said, quote, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, unquote. Another one is the time of his coming, the manner of his birth, betrayal by Judas, and the betrayal price, the manner of his death, the people's reaction, the mocking and spitting, the staring, the casting of dice for his clothes, the non-tearing of his garment, etc. Half the prophecies are beyond his fulfillment. He couldn't work it out to be born of the seed of the woman, the lineage of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, etc. No wonder Jesus and the apostles appealed to fulfilled prophecy to substantiate his claim. Why did God go to all this trouble? I believe he wanted Jesus to have all the credentials uh, he needed uh, when he came into the world. Yet the most exciting thing about Jesus Christ is that he came to change lives. He alone proved correct the hundreds of Old Testament prophecies that described his coming. And he alone can fulfill the great, greatest prophecy of all for those who will accept accept it, the promise of new life. Quote, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Unquote. That's the end of this chapter here. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to chapter 10 in the next study. But uh, let me get uh, your... any. Uh, summary thoughts or closing thoughts from each of you. Brother Joe? Well, uh, just to defend my frailty, <clears throat> I, I, I did say exponential, meaning that uh, the difference between uh, 12 zeros in, uh, in the billions of people on Earth and the 17 zeros was, is an exponential factor, meaning every zero is times 10. So uh, the first zero would be 10 times greater than the number before, and the next zero would be 10 times greater than that number, and so on. And pretty soon you've got enough uh, quarters to fill Texas. But uh, I, I also want to say that, you know, there's no other source in mankind's history where uh, prophecy is, is uh, valid or real. I mean, the greatest of all prophets uh, outside of Scripture would be what? Rasputin? <laughs> you know, Nostradamus, whatever. Uh, Gene Dixon? Uh, there is no source of prophecy that is uh, verifiable in all of mankind's history that has even one or two prophecies that stand the, the scrutiny of what Scripture gives thousands of times. And that seems to escape people. I mean, doesn't it? Uh, when, when you take an antitheist, or someone who, who denies the validity of Scripture, 
and you sit down, and if you can just, just without question, like the the, the tearing off of his clo Christ's clothes and Roman guards throwing dice or drawing straws to see who gets his clothing, that is absolutely beyond question a, a very particular and specific prophecy. There's thousands of them, even to this day with Israel becoming a nation again in one day with all of its people returning to, to Jerusalem. Uh, you know, there's no other source in history that is anything close to that. Hello, Jordan. Come on in, baby. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm still waiting. If someone can give me a source in all of mankind's history that has even one or two prophecies that are incontrovertible, I would be really amazed. I don't think it exists. And so for people to point at Scripture and say, yeah, it's a bunch of fairy tales. I don't get it. I just don't get it. And and I even made notes this time, Luke. But I don't know what I was talking about when I read when I wrote them. Uh, so I'll go back to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, once you explain your exponential uh, math. Then I understand now that you, you certainly are very good at math. I apologize. Here comes it, Brother Ted. Well, no, I don't. I don't have anything to add to this other than just to say, wow, uh, this, these these facts and these figures can just uh, just overwhelm your mind. I mean, these are these are staggering uh, statistical prob probability versus improbability. Uh, of this all coming true in the person of Christ uh, just makes him stand alone. Uh, there's no other way to look at it. There's no other way to look at it if somebody looks at it uh, rationally and reasonably, uh, open-minded uh, uh, with these with these mathematical figures that you've laid out here today, Luke. Uh, I, I just don't see it any other way. So that's it. Yeah. Uh, well, when you when you look at not only the uh, the prophecies being fulfilled, the, the the manuscript evidence supporting the scriptures, the accuracy, the historicity, uh, the uh, the uh, what occurred with the the apostles before and after the resurrection, what occurred in the change in the apostle Paul, uh, what uh, the um, the resurrection uh, the the, um, the all the arguments that we've discussed uh, supporting the the resurrection and the the, the, uh, the silliness of the arguments trying attempting to refute it all all of that considered if if a person doesn't just throw up their hands and admit defeat that wait there there is no rational way I can reject that the Bible is true. It's accurate. It's the Word of God. And therefore, what it says about Jesus is true. He is eternal God Almighty, the Son of God, the Savior, and, and uh, the sole source of life everlasting in heaven. And, and all, all these things, that's the only thing, conclusion you can make unless you want to be irrational and just anti-theist. Uh, and your mind is absolutely closed. <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a phrase that I've heard people argue um, uh, who are these anti-theists? They, they they argue about a, a Christian like us. They they say, well, you're you believe in the God of the gaps. If I understand what they mean by that, it's just that well, if you can't explain something, then you just use God as the answer. And and like for example, well, God. Uh, I mean, there's uh, how did life begin? I mean, I mean the uh, how did matter and energy come into existence? We know now that. It's, uh, people used to think that the universe was eternal, and now it's universally accepted by all science scientists. That, and nobody argues that the universe ha uh, uh, is eternal. They say, it, it, yes, it had a beginning. And, uh, and they sometimes say, it, it re refer to it, it was started with a big bang. We know in the Bible says that God spoke it into existence, uh, but it had a beginning. And, and so what? It, what how did it get even if you believe there's a big bang and it just happened, well, what caused it to happen? What's the, well, 
everything is, has a cause. Well, there, you've got to go back. If you if you regress infinitely back, you comes a point where there must be an uncaused cause, and that is God. And uh, so, uh, you know, they, they'd say well, that life evolved from sim simple forms to what we we are today. Uh, and yet, we, 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 when we point out the impossibilities of these changes and the arguments against it, and they, they have no answer. You know, there's no rational uh, answer. And when you ask them, well, okay, if life evolved, what happened? How, what brought life into existence originally? They don't have an answer. That's, uh, what's the word, uh, generation, uh, spontaneous generation? I, I forgot the, 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 the term that's used for that, the initial beginning of life. Well, our answer is God. And they say, well, you're just using God as the God of the gap. You don't have an answer. So you can just say it must be God. And I say that they are uh, desperate that there is no God. And I've made this point in one of the earlier studies on it. And that's that uh, what other thing can we conclude is that they are desperate to reject God. Why? I don't know. I, I think there's probably a majority reason that for most people, and then maybe there's unique reasons for others, but for the most part, people will say anything but God. It must be some other explanation. And that what they are is saying, as we say, that God's the answer, the obvious answer. If we don't have an answer for something, we say it's God that did it. And they, they say, no, the answer is anything but God. Even thinking that, well, maybe aliens planted the first life on Earth. And then even if we say, okay, let's suppose that was true, where did the aliens come from? We still can regress back and say, well, what caused life to begin with aliens? <laughs> you know, uh, what other aliens planted them? Well, what about those other aliens? What caused their life to begin? And we say the answer is God. And they, they are just desperate. Anything but God. And I, I guess it's because they just don't want to have any higher authority than themselves. No, no one to answer to. No one to, to get credit to. Uh, and, and we, who believe in uh, the one true God that we find in the Bible, that uh, we are just thankful that we know him and that we've understood that he caused everything to come into existence and he's the one that created all things and gave us life and purpose uh, all right um, before I give the the gospel uh, invitation here uh, let me get it any, any last words for each of you uh, brother Joe yeah Luke uh, I think it's important to realize that we live in a world where people are uh, taught to uh, suspect the validity of Scripture, uh, we we uh, live in a world that that teaches and preaches materialism, and it actually goes against the grain of of human nature. God gave us a natural desire to seek Him out. All like I said uh, in a previous broadcast, <clears throat> all human beings have two things in common. One is family, the need for, for relationship, and the other is to find God. And so those two things are natural and innate in mankind. And our generation especially, more than any other, has been taught to suspect the Bible as, as invalid. And uh, um, Suspicion often creates what one suspects, and I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Chad? If you're talking, we can't hear you. I am very sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. I must be double tapping my uh, mute button there. Uh, well, amen to what you said, Joe. It's, it seems like the uh, the mindset of the day to be uh, 
uh, suspicious and uh, you know almost uh, hostile to to this, the claims of the scriptures and uh, as you were saying Luke uh, you know having that mindset of almost anything but God but I was looking at uh, Proverbs 16 while you were talking there and uh, I was thinking about people's thoughts and and how their thoughts are just uh, scattered all over the place and you were saying anything but God so that that you know that's unstable thoughts it's they're scattered everywhere scattered brain in that type of thinking and I just happen to look down and read Proverbs 16 3 that says commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established and that word established has the has the conveys the meaning of being stabilized you know established grounded so if you're if you're commit your works or your way to the Lord and said okay God if you're God and if you're real you know that I need to be submissive to you and you were talking about Luke people don't want to be under authority people said well God says well when people take that approach if they commit their way to the Lord their works to the Lord their thoughts their very thoughts their minds will be established uh, stabilized I think I think once again it's just showing us how true the Bible is even in our modern day so Back to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to take just a couple of minutes in closing here to tell people the the most important uh, message that we find in the entire Bible. It's it's if you learn nothing else from the Bible but this one thing, it, it would be enough that you at least we know that you are going to go to heaven, and that's what we're really most concerned about here. Is that we uh, the three of us. Uh, we are certain that we're going to go to heaven. Are you certain you're going to go to heaven? Do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, if, if you're not certain you're going to go to heaven, then uh, we want you to be able to have the certainty that we have. And uh, I'm, I'm not boasting that I'm going to go to heaven because I think I'm so good or that I'm better than you. No, not at all. Uh, I'm just saying that I'm certain I'm going to go to heaven because the scriptures tell me Jesus promises me I'm going to go to heaven because I put my faith in him. So the, 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 in Romans, uh, by the way, I, in, in the description box of all my videos, I, I post the same thing in every one of them. It's a, it's a statement of faith that, that, that cites the, or uh, states the, um, the core doctrines of Christianity and also some Bible verses that support what I'm going to tell you now about what do you have to do if you want to go to heaven? What must I do to be saved and go to heaven? And in, in Romans 10.3, it says basically there's, there's two ways. Uh, most people, the, almost all people, think that they're going to go to heaven by establishing their own righteousness. And is that what you think? Do you think that someday you're going to die and then go up before God and God will judge you and, and, God, and God deems that you've been good enough, you get to go to heaven. If you've been righteous enough, good enough, then God will accept you. Uh, that's what most people think. In Romans 10.3 it says most people are trying to get to heaven by establishing their own righteousness. They don't understand that God's way is by receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And not not through our own righteousness. So this is what you need. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that we get his righteousness credited to us uh, at the moment we put our faith in him. So that therefore when we go to heaven, instead of pleading that, oh God, let me into heaven because I'm I've done this and I've done that. No, we reject that as 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 the way. We understand that that is, um, as Jesus said, it's impossible. And Paul and, and James tell us that if that's the way you're trying to get to heaven, you'd have to do it perfectly. From your birth to your death, you must never have made one sin. But the Bible says we've all sinned. The Bible says that if we say or think we have never sinned, then we're just deceiving ourselves. And the Bible says that you, to get to heaven on your own righteousness, you'd have to be able to present yourself to God blameless, perfect, never done one thing wrong. Now, if you understand, that means you're in a hopeless, helpless situation. 
if you understand that's impossible, as Jesus stated, then you can understand your need to be rescued, to be saved. And that <clears throat> the Bible says that that's exactly what God has done for us. The Bible says Jesus is eternal God Almighty. It says that he came down from heaven and became a man. Now, why would God become a man? The, Jesus says he came down and be, to give his life as a ransom. God can't die. He had to become a man in order to die. And his death on the cross, the Bible says it served as a full payment for the sins of the world. All of your sins, all of my sins, all this, the sins of all people who have ever lived were put on Jesus Christ on, while he was on that cross. The, the Bible says he became sin for us. The, so much sin was put on him, he just seemed like he was sin. And so he took away the sins of the world. So now the, the sin issue between man and God has been resolved. Jesus paid for our sins. Now you can be with God. But the problem remains, you're mortal, you're doomed to die. The Bible says that we're, we're all destined to die, be judged, and then the second death. Now, if you want to avoid the second death, if you want to have life everlasting, Jesus says that believing in him is the way to get life everlasting. So, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for your sins, and he was buried, but when he rose, raised himself from the dead, he said, that's the sign that I'm going to give you to prove that I am God and Savior. And he did it. We've talked extensively about this bodily resurrection in these studies. The resurrection is what gives us confidence that the claims of Jesus are true. And the resurrection, the Bible says, is the first fruit. Uh, Jesus was the first of the resurrection. And that you and I, all of us, are going to someday be resurrected. Some people will be resurrected to the judgment and condemnation, the second death, and the rest of us who put our faith in Jesus will be resurrected unto life everlasting because of our faith in Jesus. So if you want to go to heaven, if you want to live in what the Bible says is the new heavens and the new earth, where there will be no more sickness or death or sorrow or crying, only joy and bliss and happiness forever and ever. If that's what you want, it's offered to you by Jesus. And the Bible says it's a free gift, no strings attached, no requirements placed upon you. Jesus did everything that was required. He lived a perfect life, and you'll get credit for it. He died for your sins, so you don't have to pay for them. The only thing that's required of you is believing in Jesus for your salvation. Believe now that you are going to go to heaven because... Jesus promised it to you. And once you believe it, you receive it. I hope you put your faith in him right now. Uh, I'm Brother Ted and Brother Joe, thank you for participating again. <clears throat> and I uh, look forward to the next one. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.